But when we start talking about things that look like evidence, they want to act like they blind. They don't know what this is. These are our national secrets. Looks like in the to me. This looks like more evidence of our national secrets, say on a stage at Mar-a-Lago. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to grandstand for political purposes rather than work with Democrats and fix an immigration system that has been broken for decades. Republicans continue to vilify people, including mothers and their children. And as I just said, we just lost a mother and her children. Honestly, I can't tell if y'all are for anything other than obstruction and cruelty. Just take a look at my governor last week. He said, and I quote, the only thing we're not doing is we're not shooting people who come across the border because of course, the Biden administration would charge us with murder. I know Governor Abbott doesn't understand the law, but let me say this, that absolutely would be murder. I don't want us to base anything on Georgia at all. Please, Jesus, not Georgia. Okay, because Georgia purged 87,000. Will the gentlewoman yield? Not, I think I Georgia not, matters. I will not yield. I am reclaiming my time. This is a ridiculous expectation, so ridiculous as to raise the suspicion that it's intended solely to render the bill unworkable and meaningless. This amendment would serve only to challenge law enforcement uh, who are properly doing their job to stop smugglers and illegal aliens from terrorizing their communities. If the gentleman has opposition and has an offer to define actively assisting, then that would be great. But the reality is that what's going to happen is what we've seen happen in the state of Texas, where we have a governor who has murders on his hand as far as I'm concerned, because we've had active deaths at the hands of mishandling this. If this is going to be a federal issue, then the federal government needs to be the ones that are absolutely going to be over federal law. It's so weird because my colleagues on the other side of the aisle wanted to call uh, this hearing, this is not our first, it's not our second. I, I've actually lost count myself of how many IRS hearings we're having. And they seemingly feel like they can fix your very complicated issues, but somehow they aren't good at simple math. Simple math that would get them to a speaker, you know, like the, right. So we've been three weeks without one. Mr. Bobolinski, I know that you take exception to the fact that your credibility has been called into question over and over, but when someone comes to testify under oath, whether it's before this committee, behind closed doors, or in person, then we have to evaluate someone's credibility. And sir, I definitely have always had issues with your credibility, as I know that you are very well aware of. So let me remind you of well, what you, happened behind <coughs> closed doors. I well, you should asked, ask Ro Khan about my credibility. I haven't asked credibility. you a question. Okay. You are? When I, I haven't. So oh, when okay, I ask I'm you a sorry. question, that's when you answer. Otherwise, I'm talking. So. Excuse me? Chair, now recognize Ms. Crockett for one minute, or five minutes. <laughs> one minute. All right. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, member, Mr. Bobolinski, do you know who Elections LLC is? Yeah. Mark. Well, it's not a who. Okay, well, do you know what it is? Yes, it's a LLC. Okay, and is it the LLC that your attorney works for? Uh, I believe so, yes. You believe so, okay. Um, so at this point in time, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a document indicating that the law firm representing Tony Bobolinski was paid $10,000 as recently as January of this year by the Save America PAC, which you may recognize as Donald Trump's PAC. Without objection. Thank you. Now, so far in this hearing, it has felt like the worst episode of The Apprentice. I'm sure you're familiar with that show. It seems like my colleagues and maybe you and some others are trying to become the next vice president of the United States of America. You're auditioning or something like that. I want to be clear that when we were behind closed doors, you called a number of people liars. You called the Wall Street Journal liars. You called Cassidy Hutchison a liar. You called yes. the FBI a liar. You called Rob Walker a liar. You called James Gillier a liar. You called Hunter Biden a liar. You called Jim Biden a liar. And just today, you added to your list. You called my colleague, Congressman Mr. Goldman, a liar as well. It seems like, according to you, the only person that's telling the truth is you and everyone else is lying. But 
I want to move on to something else. Is that a question? It's or? not a question. Oh, okay. You'll know when I ask you a question, I promise. So much, Mr. Chair. Before I begin my questioning, I want to remind everyone that the information recorded in the FBI Form 1023 that my Republican colleagues keep citing is not evidence of anything. This form reflects years old, secondhand, unverified information from a Ukrainian oligarch as relayed to the FBI by a confidential human source. These unverified secondhand allegations have been repeated repeatedly debunked and undermined, including by the confidential human source who relayed this information to the FBI. The tip recorded in the Form 1023 was thoroughly explored by the U.S. attorney handpicked by Donald Trump, which was Attorney, attorney General William Barr, and the assessment was closed. Finally, Devin Archer, Hunter Biden's former business partner who worked with the Ukrainian oligarch in question, told this committee in a transcribed transcribed interview in July that he had no knowledge of any such payments allegedly described in this form. Repeating the same lies will not somehow turn them into truths. Kind of like the election that Trump lost. Say it with me, he lost it. Repeating the same lie that he won wasn't going to turn the election around. The lost in this chamber keep pushing lies and lunacy on behalf of a multi-time loser. So if we're gonna talk about China, let's go ahead and talk about China and let's talk about the dealings. And let me point out the fact that right now, each of you has admitted that none of you are fact witnesses. We walked in without facts and unfortunately, because what we say isn't necessarily evidence, we have wasted the American people's time and we are gonna walk out of this chamber and we still have no facts that are leading to anything. But let me give y'all a, a little bit of tea while we're here. So. I have a document that I will ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record. It's a fact sheet on President Trump's shady business dealings with the Chinese government. What, did, what are you entering in? A, a record from who? This is from the Congressional Integrity. Congressional uh, Integrity Project, the dark money pack? I, I object. I object to that, too. Of course y'all going to object, but we're going to talk about it. What? So, uh, it says... Trump has extensive financial ties to the Chinese government. President Trump collected millions from Chinese government-owned entities while in office. I have the best tenants in the world, President Trump, was well aware of the multi-million dollar lease to Chinese interests. President Trump promised to donate foreign government, government profits while in office, but he donated less than a third of his proceeds from the Chinese government. President Trump maintained three foreign bank accounts while in office, including one in China. President Trump's business with China China raised legal and ethical concerns. President Trump, President Xi loves the people of China. He loves his country and he's doing a very good job. Let me tell you something. I don't want to talk about what y'all want to act like is some big mystery because we keep sitting here and Professor Gerhardt, just, just to be clear, as my colleagues have even tried to provide evidence, which they're not the ones to provide evidence, have you ever heard them say if since we've been sitting here for I don't know how long? Yes, I, I, um, I've been taking a tally. Oh, okay. Can you um, show us? Can you so tell us what the tally is? More than 35 times the Republican witnesses and Republican members of the committee have used the word if. Thank you so um, much for that. Because honestly, if they would continue to say if or Hunter and we were playing a drinking game, I would be drunk by now. Thank you so much. Texas on top of Texas. Very interesting. My colleague just mentioned that we should talk about facts instead of fallacy. So I do want to make sure that we address a couple of facts, starting with the fact that Republicans claim to be pro-life, but they're anything but. Considering the fact that we just had a woman and her two children that died, they drowned in the state of Texas because our governor decided that federal authorities should not be allowed to actually try to save those people. Order, Mr. Chairman, could you instruct the member to not use profanity uh, to interrupt other members? And can we not keep running down my time? We'll hold your time. You'll get it back. Uh, remind members uh, to uh, have decorum during the hearing today. Ms. Crockett, you may continue. Please restore 10 seconds to her time. The fact is, these people died at our border. In Texas, on Friday, we are here today having a hearing and the pro-life party does not want to talk about the fact that there was basically state-issued or sanctioned death at the Texas border. 
There can be nothing more inhumane than the fact that we have not even decided that we were going to discuss this on the pro-life side. But you know what? I, I do want to talk about some other facts that we have. Republicans can't do the basic job that we are supposed to do. You see, in two days, we are scheduled to shut down. They can't figure out how to do a budget because we're six months behind, but somehow they are going to solve this complex issue of immigration. I seriously doubt it. And to quote a great known as Riri, also known as Rihanna, how about we give a round of applause, a standing ovation, because we have absolutely had nothing more than performative politics. In fact, my Texas colleague just finished his comments by specifically talking about the election in November and who's going to win it. I hail from the great state of Texas, and what's interesting to me is we always want to talk about privileges and compare what is required for a privilege versus comparing what is required for a constitutionally protected right under our federal constitution. And it's interesting that in this chamber, we love to talk about the Second Amendment and, and we wanna make sure that everyone has guns. And we only have one amendment in our constitution that deals with guns and it's the Second Amendment. And Professor Weiser, you were just about to say we have multiple provisions, so you were messing up my test a little bit. Um, so I'm not gonna let you answer the question. I'm gonna go down here to these experts. Let's start and go the other way. Do we know how many amendments actually address voting in our Constitution? Uh, well, it depends how you count them, but you could say three, fifth, okay. 14th, 15th. Okay. Mr. Spees? Plus the DC I, amendments. And maybe first. Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, Professor, go ahead and break it down. I believe it's six. There we go. There we go. So we got the 14th, we got the 15th, 17th, wait a minute, did I mess up? 19th, 24th, and 26th. There we go. All right, so we have six amendments. 23rd. And, and every time we dealt with an amendment dealing with voting, we were expanding upon access. Is that not correct? That is correct. That is the history of this country. Expanding. Okay. The, the history is to expand, but obviously there are some folk that want to rewrite history and make sure we go back in time. So are you familiar with the fact that there are black folk that died in this country to make sure that black folk had access to the ballot box? Yes, that is correct. Are you also familiar with the fact that probably around 1913 or sometime around there, there was maybe a women's suffrage march. Yes, yes. And that was a fight again for women to have access to the ballot box, was it not? Yes, it was. Okay, so we have had throughout history these fights to make sure that everyone is accessing the ballot box, but seemingly when it comes down to say guns in this country, which are the number one killer of children in this country, we haven't had half as many hearings about guns as we've had on voting rights. And every time we seemingly have a hearing on voting rights, we talking about the fact that people are cheating. So let's talk about who's cheating. I got a few articles. Uh, are you familiar with the fact that there was recently a settlement with this uh, little news company called Fox News? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, that was for about 780 something million dollars. Was it because they were lying about the, the elections? Yes, it was for a... Um, okay, there we go. Event. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, there also was this article, because I don't want us to base anything on Georgia at all. Please, Jesus, not Georgia. Okay, because Georgia purged 87,000... Will the gentlewoman yield? Not, I think I Georgia not, matters. I will not yield. I am reclaiming my time. All right, so there were 87,000 people that were purged that were legitimate voters. So, no, we don't want to copy off of Georgia. Um, also, another GOP voter admits he committed fraud... Another one in Pennsylvania, man who admits he voted for Trump with his dead mom's name because he listened to too much propaganda. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlelady from the state of Georgia, Ms. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As legislators, it's our job to make sure we are not moving forward with drafting legislation that is on its face flawed. If we want to legislate and address immigration, let's mean what we say and do so in an effective manner. And this bill does not live up to that standard. 
The inclusion of the term actively assisting is ripe for judicial scrutiny and will undoubtedly result in court challenges, wasting taxpayer dollars and government resources. But fiscal issues caused by poor legislative drafting are the least of my concerns with this bill. This language is so deeply concerning because we already have been witnessing how aggressive policing tactics and unconstitutional racial profiling directed by rogue governors like Governor Greg Abbott have led to severe harm to and has undermined our legal system, all in the name of actively assisting the U.S. Border Patrol. Take, for instance, this past Christmas, where U.S. citizens, a husband, wife, their 13-year-old daughter, and their grandmother living in El Paso were wrongfully targeted by Texas officers in unmarked vehicles after they were coming back from visiting relatives just across the border in Mexico. The officers ran the family off the road, and at least four Texas Department of Public Safety officers wearing street clothes and tactical vests quickly surrounded their car and began pointing semi-automatic rifles at them. Because of the accident, the grandmother had to receive x-rays and still has lingering back pain. The daughter, likely traumatized from having weapons of war pointed at her and her family. No one, including me, doubts more must be done to address the problems we are seeing at the border. But this type of unlawful harassment of citizens is not it. And to be clear, my amendment in no way prevents federal, state, or local officers from working with Border Patrol agents, nor does it say that federal, state, and local officers do not have a role to play here. In fact, several border counties, including counties in Texas, already have U.S. Customs and Border Protection memoranda of understanding with state and local officials to work with immigration enforcement. Nothing in my amendment would prevent these written agreements that lay out their clear chains of command and clear codes of conduct. But what my amendment does is to prevent state and local law enforcement from acting lawlessly at the misguided direction of a governor who refuses to work with men and women of the United States Border Patrol because he thinks he is above the law. If my Republican colleagues reject this amendment and keep the current language, they are supporting actions that have historically lacked due diligence to prevent harm and encourage lawlessness that leads to more dangerous instances like the one that occurred at Christmas. If the House rejects this amendment, it will give Governor Abbott a tool to carry in his to carry on in his unconstitutional border policies without federal oversight and coordination. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. Thank you, and I reserve. Gentlelady from Texas reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? I declaim time in opposition to the amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this uh, amendment requires a new fact to be proven at trial, that the pursuing law enforcement officer was, quote, under the command of the U.S. Border Patrol in each and every case. Well, I can imagine many circumstances where local law enforcement's alerted to a Border Patrol chase that's going through their jurisdiction and then act immediately to assist them without necessarily being directly under their command. The issue is not who is pursuing smugglers, but rather the circumstances of the pursuit. Namely, this person is evading the Border Patrol. It's unlikely that during each and every pursuit in progress, the Border Patrol is going to have time to deputize local law enforcement, place them under their command. This is a ridiculous expectation, so ridiculous as to raise the suspicion that it's intended solely to render the bill unworkable and meaningless. These high-speed chases occur far too often in our border communities, and state and local law enforcement are often first responders in, in protecting these communities, along with the Border Patrol. If this is going to be a federal issue, then the federal government needs to be the ones that are absolutely going to be over federal law. So. They can have memorandums of understanding if that means that every single county at the border needs to go ahead and enter into a memorandum of understanding, then they need to. But this is a federal issue. It is not a state issue. And this protects federalism and makes sure that it will be under the hands of the federal government with this federal law instead of state government. Um, I'm going to pick up right where Representative Connolly left off. Uh, out of curiosity, do either one of you know the definition of insanity? 
I think you're referring to uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Oh, okay. That's exactly what I was referring to. And it sounds like that is what this party is good at. But um, I want to talk about the theme of the day. Commissioner, you have said over and over and over the word complicated. I was not keeping a tally, but you said it a lot. So I want to work with this word a little bit. I have a list of items. I would like for you to let me know if you believe they are complicated or not. Tax returns. Complicated. Operating the IRS without proper investment. Complicated. Recruiting workers in this antagonistic environment. Complicated. Auditing millionaires and billionaires. Complicated. Okay, so it sounds like you've got a complicated job. I do. And it also sounds like you have to know something about math. My colleague brought that up as well. Um, it sounds like you need to be at least somewhat decent at counting to be with the IRS. Yes, yes. you'd agree? Okay. I'd agree. Let me ask you another question that may be another one of these when the math ain't math in situations. Um, there was a looming government shutdown a few weeks ago. And interestingly enough, uh, when I do the math, approximately a little bit more than 60% of the people that sit on this committee actually voted to shut us down. Now, out of curiosity, for everyone that claims to care about their constituents, do you think it's easier or more difficult to operate as the IRS when, say, there's a shutdown? It is very disruptive to our operations. Very disruptive. Let me give you another number that is very concerning to me. That number is 24. 24 represents the number of days that we have before the continuing resolution that 60% of, and when I say my colleagues, I'm talking about across the aisle, not on this side. We were about at 100%. Actually, we were 100% on this committee that voted to make sure that the government did not shut down. But if in 24 days, we don't have a speaker because they can't figure out their math, and we shut down. Is that going to help you answer more phone calls or less phone calls? A lot less. Oh, okay, all right. So it sounds like we have a lot of performative politics that is taking place because yet another number that was mentioned, and I believe you brought this number up, was $540 billion. You also talked about appropriations and you talked about the fact, and, and I want to be clear about this $540 billion. This $540 billion is a net number, correct? This is not a net zero, like it's going to cost $540 to go get it and that's how much we're going to get. We're talking about netting $540 billion, it's correct? Five, $540 billion, we, I would say we're on track uh, under current course and speed to get about 70 back. We're, so our hope is we'll be at 470, but yeah, it's 470 billion, which is what's owed versus what's paid. Okay, very good. How is it that the American people should believe that the majority party has the ability to solve your complex issues when number one, they don't pay attention to history, which was defunding this organization has not helped their constituents, but hurt their constituents. And let me add to that. The last time I checked, America is growing. So you were defunding your organization as we were ending up with more people, which means that you have more work, correct? Correct, more population, more filers, more changes to the tax code and more complexity in how the economy operates. 2010, when our budget reduction started, we never heard of PayPal, Venmo, all these you know, payment platforms. The gig economy changes and it's great, but we have to invest and be ready to be effective tax administrators as the world changes. That's why it's important to keep our funding at pace. I agree, and as the child of an IRS worker, I absolutely wanna thank you for what you do